I've loaded the sample project for this chapter, Objects and Classes, and I'm going to run it to demonstrate how you can use classes from the .NET framework from within your own application, just to show you what a class looks like and what you can do with it. I'll press A to run this demonstration, and here we're going to use an instance of the system.io.fileInfo class. Now here, I'm going to pass, when I create an instance of the file info class, I'm going to pass the file I'd like to work with, c colon backslash hello world dot vb. Now what we're doing is creating an instance of the class that's provided by the framework and telling it what file to work with. We're referring to that object as fi. So fi, this variable now, basically points to or refers to a file info object in memory that works with hello world.vb. We can retrieve properties of that file, like its attributes. We can take the attributes property and convert it to a string. It is itself an object. We can retrieve the full name property. We can get the is read only property. We can get the length property. Now I'd like to copy the file to a new folder, so I'll call the create directory method of the directory class provided by the system.io namespace. Note that this time, I didn't have to create an instance of the directory class. What's up with that? Well, just like you've seen before, the create directory method is a shared method of system.io.directory, which means I can call it without explicitly creating an instance of the class. The .NET runtime will create the instance, call the create directory method, and then remove the instance from memory. There we go, we create the new folder. Now I'd like to copy my file into that new folder by calling the copy to method of my fi variable. Since fi refers to a file info object, it has a copy to method, and we can copy our file to this location. The true here indicates that we want to overwrite any existing file with that name, and it returns back to be a new file info object, which represents the new file. So I copy the file, and now I can print out the full name property of the new file I just created. There we go. So we get the output. The interesting thing here is the fact that it worked with methods and properties of a class provided by the .NET framework. Okay, so let's get out of here. That's not what I wanted to show you, really. The important thing is, let's look at the documentation. If I go to Programs, I can bring up the documentation. Within the documentation, I should be able to find the class I just worked with. I'll go to the Index. Let's look at the system.io namespace. There's the system.io namespace. And if I go find it, there it is. Here you find a list of all the classes within the system.io namespace. So in their other words, a namespace contains a bunch of classes, and there's a bunch of them in here, all dealing with system.io input output procedures. Now namespaces do contain other things besides classes. Down here we have structures and delegates and enumerations and a bunch of other stuff. But it's classes that we care about right now. Individual classes contain properties. Well, let's go find one. Let's find that file info class. The file info class, if we go find its members way down here, there we go, file info members, there we go. This thing has a bunch of properties, a whole bunch of properties, as I scroll through them here, that describe the behavior of the file info that I'm working with. In addition, classes have methods. I have public methods. These are actions the file info class can take. So we've seen now that the file info class provides methods and properties and that you can look through the documentation to find those methods and properties and investigate what's available within your class. So what actually is a class? A class acts as a template for an object. Now there is many different ways to describe this as there are people trying to describe it, but here's how I think about it. A class is like a cookie cutter. You don't eat the cookie cutter, you just use it to create cookies. Well, a class is like that. That is, it acts as a template for an object, and an object represents the cookie. How about a blueprint for a house? 
You can't live in a blueprint. It just describes the behavior for the house. On the other hand, once you have a blueprint for a house, you can create lots of different instances of that house based on the description in the blueprint. Go to a tract of new houses all based on the same plans, and that's the concept. You have a blueprint that defines the house. When you create an instance of the blueprint, you're creating a real house, a three-dimensional domicile. The blueprint is the plan. The house is the object. The blueprint represents the class, just like the house represents the object. Anyway, a system.io.fileinfo class which somebody at Microsoft wrote at some point, provides code and logic to handle working with files. But the class doesn't do the work. You create an instance of the class to work with a file. Now, in order to create that instance, you need to call the constructor for the class. The instance of that file info class you're going to create, that object, refers to a specific file. And this, of course, is called an object. Now, you need some way to communicate with that object to retrieve information about, or manipulate properties of, or operate on a particular file. To do that, you need to create an instance of the class and have a variable that refers to it. Our sample included a line of code like this. And how do you read that? How about this? Create a new instance of the file info class. That's the new system.io.fileinfo part. Referring to C colon boot dot any the file I happen to choose for this slide here, and allow code to refer to this instance using a variable named fi. In this case, fi is the variable. It's going to refer to a file info instance in memory that has information about C colon boot dot any within it. It's the new keyword that creates a new instance of the class you specify. This causes the .NET runtime to run code that creates a new instance of that type and hands you back a reference. There's some code buried deep in the framework that can create objects for you based on the instructions in your code. In C or C++, that reference would be called a pointer. We don't use the P word, that's pointer, in .NET. Instead, we just say it's a reference to an object. Code inside the class that runs as the class is created is called the constructor. There's a procedure buried in that file info class that runs as it's created that takes that file name and says, oh, he wants me to look at c colon boot dot any or whatever file you pass. I'll go get information about that file. The class can, and often does, contain multiple constructors. It's overloading, the overloading feature in .NET that makes this possible. Each of the constructors have to have different sets of parameters. So at compile time, the compiler can tell which one of those procedures you mean to call based on the parameters you've specified for the procedure. Classes can expose members as either shared or instance members. Shared members work with all instances of the class, not just one. On the other hand, instance members work only with a specific instance of the class. The designers of the class determine which members require a class instance, most of them do, and which don't, that is, which members are shared members. You'll need to look carefully at class definitions to determine which members are instance members and which ones aren't. For example, file info.length is an instance member. It requires a specific file. I mean, if you want to find the length of a file, you better have a file to find the length of. On the other hand, directory.create directory doesn't require an instance because you're going to create the directory. You don't have to have a directory already to create one. So that isn't an instance member. It's just a service provided by the class. When you create your own classes, you choose which technique to use. You might also ask, why did we work with the file info class but not the directory info class? Because file info and directory info refer to a specific file or directory, and the file and directory classes, they each have a pair of classes, work with all files and directory. They provide services for working with files and directories. Because I just wanted to create a new directory, I used the directory.create directory method. Didn't create an instance of a class, I used a non-instance member to do the work. 
Back in the documentation, how can you tell if a member is an instance member or not? Well, if you look down here, none of these are marked specially, so how could you tell? Well, I'll show you how you can tell. Let's look at a different class instead. For example, the system.io.directory class here. If we look at its members, you see something different. There's a big S next to every method or property that is not an instance method. Now here, you see the word static appear in the tooltip. For VB developers, that should be shared. Isn't it convenient that both static and shared, the two language keywords, begin with S? So they use a big S in the documentation. I have no idea what they do in other languages where the two keywords don't begin with the same letter. I'm guessing in German, for example, the keywords for static and shared aren't the same. Maybe they use the English keywords. I don't know. But in English, you see the big S next to methods that are static or shared, depending on which language you care about. And next to the ones that are instance methods, you see nothing at all. For example, well, there really aren't many here in the directory class that aren't shared. Actually, it's interesting. All the ones that aren't marked as shared or static are methods that it inherits from the object base class. So far, you've only used classes that other people have created. Don't you have the urge to create your own classes? Well, it's just like the .NET framework. You create classes and expose properties, methods, and events, and stuff like that. Your application probably should consist of a number of classes. That's the object-oriented way to build applications. Each of these classes provides a bit of your application's functionality. You might be tempted to write applications that consist of lots of procedures called for main, just like our demonstration application. That's all we've done. You have to resist that urge. You want to design your application so that you're working with objects, methods, and properties. Generally, objects represent things or events that occur. For example, a font, a text box, a customer, an order. Each of these is a thing, and you can also think of objects representing events, such as a phone call or a letter being received or something like that. An object represents a thing or an event. Things generally have properties that describe the thing, methods that are actions the thing can take, or events that indicate when the thing has changed its state. Well, I think we're going to have to just jump in and create our own class to get a flavor for how this all works. To get started, I'll go to the project menu and choose Add Class. Well, that's one way to do it. Another is to right-click on the project and choose Add, and from the list here, choose Class. And I tend to use this technique. I'll start by adding a class, and I'll name the class, I don't know, pick a name, MyCustomer.VB. Click Add. And at that point, we have a customer class called My Customer here. And although I could have given it the correct name to begin with, it does allow me to show off renaming the class because it's important to understand that the file name and the class name aren't really linked. There's an artificial linking because it's comfortable to have the same name for both, but you don't have to. In any case, before you've supplied a name for your class, it has the default name based on the file. And if you come along and rename the file, which you can do either here in the Properties window or by right-clicking and choosing Rename, and I'll change it to Customer1.VB. When I do that, because I hadn't assigned the class its own name, it assumed the new name for the file. If, on the other hand, I had already assigned the class its own name, renaming the file wouldn't update the class name. It's just nice to know that behavior exists. Okay, so we're going to come in here and add some functionality to our class. Inside the class, I'm going to create a public variable named customer ID and make it a string. Although this is technically called a field because it's just a public variable within the class, it gets treated as a property of the class. And we'll see that when we play with the class. Let me add here a method now. I'll add a sub called display ID. And I'll have this do nothing more than just display in the console window the customer ID. 
Now, there's a couple things going on. Did you notice that IntelliSense, as I was typing? Here we're seeing properties and methods of the current class as I'm typing in the current class. That's pretty, pretty clever there. Now, what does that me keyword mean here? The me keyword in Visual Basic indicates you want to refer to the current instance of this class. So this code, whenever it runs, always refers to the customer ID of the current instance of the class. As you'll see, we can create multiple instances of the same class in memory at the same time, but me inside the class always refers to that current instance, the one that is currently running. I'd like to try playing with this class now. So I'm going to go over to our main module, which includes all of our sample code, and in here, I have a procedure called test customer one, and I'd like to add some code here. Let's put in something like this. I'm going to dimension a variable, cust a, as new customer one. Notice the IntelliSense that's helping us out. I can dimension a second variable as well, cust b, as new customer one. So now I would have two instances of the same class in memory at the same time. Let's set the customer ID property for each of them. Cust a dot customer ID equals, well, customer A, so we'll name him A. Cust B, I'm making up stuff here, dot customer ID, got to spell it right, of course, equals, why not? So now we have two customers with each of them having their own unique customer ID value. And we can display that information. Something like this should do it. Console.writeline cust A's customer ID is, and let's display it. And what will we say it is? We can get that from cust A dot, and we can retrieve the customer ID property. And there it is. We should be able to do the same thing with customer B. Let me copy that to the clipboard, paste it back in and change this to be cust B. And here we can retrieve cust B's customer ID. In addition, we can call a method of each one. I can call cust A dot display ID and cust B dot display ID. Because each one of these variables, cust A and cust B, refers to an instance of the customer one class, each variable exposes a customer ID property and a display ID method. So we have a procedure that should allow us to display information about our two customers. So let's try it. I'll press F5. Uh, I'll save it first. Press F5 to go. And I'll press letter A, oh, B, for try customer one class. Seems to work. We retrieved the customer ID from cust A, which was AAAA, and we retrieved the customer ID from cust B. Both of them were instances of the same class, just like a house can be an instance of a blueprint, and a cookie can be an instance of a cookie, well, well, you know what I mean. We have multiple instances of the same template for a customer in memory at the same time. And each of them maintains its own customer ID and then has its own methods that you can call as well. Okay, well, that was pretty simple stuff. Let's get out of here. Let's go back to our customer one class and enhance it a little bit. At this point, I'd like to add a feature known as XML comments to this class. It's pretty easy and extremely useful when writing code and when creating documentation. So I'll come along here and insert, watch the magic now, three apostrophes. And when I do that, Visual Studio inserts a set of comments that describe this member of the class. So I can do the same for the method down here and I get my XML comments. I like putting a blank line between them so I can read it. And now, for these things, let's add the text. I'll come in here and say something like, unique identifier for this customer. If only I could type. There we go. And down here, for the method, we can add more information. Like, well, you know what? Before I do a method, I want to add another method, just to show off a feature. Let me come in here and add a little fancier version of this method. Public sub display ID, and this time I'll pass in some text. 
Now, do you find it confusing that we have two methods with the same name? That concept is called overloading. We'll discuss it in detail elsewhere. But the fact is, Visual Basic allows you to have multiple procedures with the same name as long as those procedures accept different parameters. Therefore, when you write your code, you choose between the two, and the compiler can tell which one you mean to call based on the parameters you pass to it. So in this case, I'd like to do something like console.writeLine, whatever text you pass in, followed by the customer ID. That'd be text ampersand, say a colon, followed by me.customerID. So we get a prompt, just to have, an, have two different versions of this procedure. OK, now here, I'm going to add XML comments to this one. And let's notice that here, the parameter also has an XML comment describing it. OK, so let's come back here and fill these in. For this one, I'll put in something like display the customer ID field in the console window. Close enough. In this one, display the customer ID field in the console window with a prompt. OK, and we'll describe the parameter. The parameter here might be something like text to prefix the customer ID. So there you have it. We've added XML comments for our methods. Now we could add remarks as well, and those would help when writing documentation based on this class. There are tools that can extract the XML comments and turn them into documentation if you want. OK, let me rebuild this thing. There we go. Go back to our test procedure here. And let's add a little more code here. If I try cust a dot display ID, now notice that I have two different overloads for this. Also notice the text that appears below the description. Where do you think that came from? That came from the XML comments that we added to our class. So adding XML comments makes it easier for consumers of your code to use the methods and properties because they'll see as they're typing the XML text that you entered within the class. Let's finish this method call by using the new method we created and put something like just a prompt like that. OK, if we run it one more time, let's save it. You'll see that this time, when we call that third display ID method call, we get the prompt in front of it because we called the overloaded version that included the prompt text. I'll close out this application so we can look at another tool that Visual Studio provides. When you're working with classes, sometimes you'll want to be able to look at the classes in a class view environment. And we have a tool that does that. We have a class view tool. This allows us to examine our projects in terms of the classes in that project. There we go. We get a list of our classes. Now, how is this different than the Solution Explorer window? The difference is Solution Explorer is based on files. The class view is based on classes. The difference is a file within our project can contain within it multiple classes. Although we haven't done it, that could happen. And the class view would allow you to see the classes, not the files. And sometimes that's useful. OK, here, in addition, if I expand or select this, I can see down below We can see down here all the members of the class as well. Here are those two display ID methods plus the customer ID property, all here within this class view window. Now they have the capability to search for items as well in case you end up with so many classes that you can't remember where things are. Now in addition, Visual Studio provides a really useful tool that is the class designer window. So once I've selected a class, I can choose View Class Diagram, and that brings up a visual designer for the class. Let's try it. Here you'll see for Customer 1, a blob at the top that represents it, and down at the bottom, all of the details of the members of that class. Right now, we have two methods named Display ID. We have one field named customer ID. Remember, a field is different than a property. A field is just a public member 
like a string in this case, of the class. We'll create a real property in just a bit. Let's look at those methods we already added. Here, for example, for the display ID, you can see we have two versions, and one of them accepts a parameter named text of type string. We even get the XML comments displayed here. Well, it wouldn't be very helpful if you could only look at things here. You can also modify things here as well. So for example, here on this parameter, we could modify this text. Let's say just some text goes here. And now if we go back to our code, let's save it, go back to the code for this, I can right click and choose View Code you'll see that that text got updated as well. So it's a two-way sort of designer. You can modify the class here, or you can modify the class in that class diagram here. I'd like to use this class designer to create yet another class. So let's save everything, close everything down here, and now I'd like to bring up the class diagram once again. Let's get that back. You know, I've gotten the window so messed up I can't find anything, so I'll go to Reset Window Layout. It's a good tool to have. And let me open up that class diagram once again. There we are. Let me right click and choose Add New Class. You can see you can add all sorts of things to this class designer. We'll add a class at this point. The dialog box asks what I'd like to name the class, and I'll name it Customer2. It asks where you'd like to put this class, and by default it's in a file with the same name as the class, and that's fine. Or you could add it to an existing file. I really don't recommend for the most part, until you have a real reason to do so, placing more than one class within a single file. Click OK. It just makes it harder to find things, so why do it that way? I'd like to add a number of different methods and properties to this class. We're going to add a class constructor that allows us to pass in a customer ID. That means the consumers of this class will have to pass a customer ID when they create an instance of the class. We'll have a read-only customer ID property, so people can retrieve the customer ID of the customer. We'll have a read-write customer name, city, region, country, and postal code properties. We'll have a method that can update the city, region, and postal code. And we'll have a second version of that method, which we'll call update location, that allows us to update city, region, country, and postal code. We'll have local storage for the property values. We're not going to use fields for properties in this case. We're going to use real properties. And you'll see what that entails in just a moment. So to do this, I'm going to right click and choose Add. And we'll add a constructor. Now I'm going through all these steps so you see what kinds of things you can do with this tool. It's really very useful. Add a constructor. There I've got my constructor named new. And in this case, I need to add a parameter. The parameter I'm going to add is customer ID. And its type is going to be string. Well, by default, it appears that it is string. Now a constructor is just a method. It's a method whose name is always new, so that when you say dim x as new customer2, it runs this procedure. So when you write the code dim variable as new something, all you're really doing is calling a method in the class whose name is new. That's the same thing. That's what you're doing. Here in the summary for this parameter, I'll add text id for the new customer. So we've got our XML comment then for that parameter. That's our constructor. Let's add a property now. I'll right click, choose Add Property, and that adds a new property down here. I don't have to go through that dialog box. I can always just come down here in the class details and add stuff. The property I'm going to add is Customer ID. And there it is. It shows up here. OK, we're all set here. And that's all we need. Oh, we do need it to be a string, however, so I'll change it into a string here. Now I need to repeat that for each of the other properties I need, and I'll just come here and type them. I need customer name, which is going to be a string as well. Down here I need city, which is going to be a string. I need region, 
which is going to be a string. All my properties seem to be strings in this class. Doesn't have to be that way, of course. And finally, postal code, which is also a string. When I end up here, I've got a bunch of properties in my class, and you can see them visually here within the class designer. I'm going to need to add my two update location methods now. So I'm going to right click, choose add method, and it puts it right here. And the name for this is update location. There we go. And the update location method is going to need some parameters. So I can just expand it and start adding parameters. The parameters I'm going to need are new city, which is going to be a string. I need new region, which is also going to be a string. That's good. And finally, new postal code, which is also a string. Great. Now I'm going to need another update location method. So I could either right click and add it here or just come down here and add it. Update location. And this one also needs parameters. It needs new city as string. It needs new region as string. It needs new postal code as string. And finally, new country as string. There we go. So we've now added all of our properties and methods to our class. We have two update location methods, and we have a constructor plus all the properties that we've added for this class. Now we're going to need some place to store the values for these properties. So I need to add some fields to this class. Now normally, these are called backing fields. That is, private variables where you store the values of your properties. So we need to add, for example, underscore city as a string. And it's going to be private. It's marked private here. We need underscore country. It's going to be a string. And it's private. We'll need underscore region. And it will be a string. We'll need underscore postal code. And it will be a string. We'll need underscore customer name. And it will be a string. I think that's about it. We'll need one more field, which is the storage for our customer ID. And we'll make that, you got it, a string. So there we have all of the backing fields for our properties so that we have a place to put them while they're being used by the class. Now these are private because that means they'll only be available to code within the class itself. I don't want anyone outside the class being able to see or manipulate these fields. So what do we end up with? A lot of stuff here. Now, of course, I didn't have to add quite that many, but it did show off how you can add various values to this class. Well, if that's all it did, it wouldn't be very helpful. What I want to do is look at the code it generates. So if I double click, here is the class that was created by my manipulating the designer for customer two. Here are those private fields we created. Here is the constructor. Here is the public property for customer ID. Here's the public property for customer name, city, region, country, postal code, and so on. They didn't write the code. I mean, how could they possibly know what we want to do? But they did lay out the procedures. You'll see here are our two overloads for the update location procedure. This one's got three parameters. This one has four. That way we can have either one of them be called, and the compiler will figure out which one to call based on the number of parameters you pass. Notice, by the way, that this class has no constructor that accepts no parameters. What that means is there's no default constructor for this class. And what that means is that users won't be able to say dim x as new customer 2. That code won't compile. They're going to have to supply a customer ID at the time they create an instance of this class. Notice also that the name of the constructor is new. It's always named new. By naming it new, you're indicating to the compiler that it should call this procedure when you create a new instance of the class. What's up with these property procedures? You may not have seen this syntax before. For example, customer name. 
This is the code that gets called when a user tries to get or set the customer name property. When they attempt to get the customer name property, the code inside this getter, it's called a getter and a setter, inside this getter block gets called. Now what should that code do? We have a private field where we'll be storing the customer name right here. So it seems to me when a user tries to retrieve the customer name property, all we want to do is return the customer name field. And when the user tries to set the customer name, what will we do? We'll take whatever value they put on the right hand side, they're going to say cust a dot customer name equals some string, that some string gets passed to me in this variable, and I'd like to take that variable and put it into my backing field. So I'll have underscore customer name equals value. And that pattern is the same for all of these properties. For city, we'll have to return underscore city. And for the setter, we'll set underscore city equals value. And down here for region, it will be return underscore region. And down here for the setter, underscore region equals value. You get real good at typing this code after a while. For country, return underscore country, and down here we'll have underscore country equals value. Postal code, return underscore postal code, and here is underscore postal code equals value. Okay, so that takes care of most of our properties. I think I missed one customer ID up here. This one is different because the real customer ID is set when the user creates the instance. So when they call the new constructor, that is, we want to set underscore customer ID equals the value that gets passed in. That's customer ID. We take this value and store it away into that backing field when they create the instance. Okay, so when it comes time to retrieve the customer ID, sure, I can return underscore customer ID. But I want the customer ID property at this point to be read only. You should only be able to set this when you create the customer. So I would think I could come along and just delete this, right? I don't need a setter. I'll never use the setter. This should be read only. And in theory, that's the concept. In practice, it's not quite true. Because in Visual Basic, if you want to have a read only property, you have to take an extra step. The extra step is adding a keyword, but you may not know that extra step, and Visual Basic helps you out. Notice the blue squiggle. There is a smart tag there, and I can see that by the little red block. Let me do it again. You see the little red block there? I can highlight that and choose the error correction options. They tell me what the problem is. Property without a read-only or write-only specifier must provide both a get and a set. Well, I don't have a set. So here are the two options. I can either insert the missing set, and they'll add it for me, or insert the read-only specifier. That's the one I want. So in that case, Visual Basic and Visual Studio have provided a helper to help me finish this. By adding the read-only specifier, I now have a read-only property. You'll need to use read-only, the keyword, when you want to have a read-only property. You can have write-only properties as well. In that case, you have a setter but not a getter and you'll have to include the write-only keyword. I'm not quite done with the class because I have a few more things I want to do. First of all, I'd like to modify the country field so by default, its value is the good old USA. So how can I do that? It's actually pretty easy. Up here, the backing field for country by default has a value of nothing, an empty string. So why can't I just come in here and set it equal to USA. Therefore, when the class first gets created, that variable will have the value USA. If you don't set the value, that will be the value. And that's a convenient way to do that sort of thing. We haven't added a method body for the update location down here, and I'm hoping you can figure out by this point what to do. If someone calls update location passing in these three variables, what I need to do is take those three variables and put them where? I can't hear you. Ah, yes, in the backing fields. So underscore city will be new city. Underscore region will get the value from new region. And underscore postal code will get the value from new postal code. 
Okay, how about this one? Same thing, so I'll take this and copy it here and add the last one we need, which is underscore country equals new country. Now, why have two procedures? Because often you'll want to update someone's location, but they don't move from one country to another, so why do you have to pass the country in that case? It also allows me to demonstrate overloading, having two procedures that have the same name but different parameters. You know the story. Before we move on, I'd like to add one more little bit of functionality here, just to prove a point. That is, you'll often want to, given this customer, be able to print out or retrieve the city, the region, and the postal code as a single string, like Los Angeles CA 90065. So how can you do that? There's two options as far as I can tell. You could create a read-only property, or you could create a method. Let's try both alternatives. If I want to create a method, I might make a public function named getLocation as string, and in here I might return string.format and return the first piece of data, the second piece of data, and the third piece of data separated by spaces. And now, what do I put into those? That's underscore city, underscore region, and underscore postal code. Okay, so that's one way to solve the problem. Notice I use the line continuation character here, so I wouldn't have to stretch it out across the screen. It's a space, underscore, and press enter. So that's one alternative. Another alternative is to create a read-only property. Let's try that. Public read only, I'll just do it myself this time, I know it has to be there, property named location as string, and what do we return? The same thing, I'll just copy and paste it. Okay, so now we have two different ways to get the same information. You normally don't do this, you choose one or the other. But here's an important thing, when creating classes, most developers have methods that include verbs in them update location, get location, so that methods imply action. On the other hand, properties should not. Properties should indicate data. So I wouldn't name the property get location. That would be sort of a going against the grain of the design pattern we use for classes. Instead, I named the property location, so it retrieves data for me. It's up to you what you do. There's no rules on this, but it's a nice idea to think Methods imply action, so their name should include a verb. Well, it's time to try this thing out. Let me save all this. Go back to our demo base here. And let's write some code to try customer2. Here we are, and let's add our code. Well, let's create one of them, cust a as new customer2. Now, what do you know about that constructor for customer2? it's going to require us to pass a parameter. If I try doing this, the code won't compile. It tells me that the argument wasn't specified for parameter customer ID on this procedure. So I'm going to have to specify a customer ID. And I'll use one of the customer IDs from our friendly Northwind sample database, which every developer is friendly with. And I will choose for my second one, cust B as new customer2, and choose a different customer ID. Okay, let's set some properties. How about cust a dot customer name? And notice here we get all of the properties that we added. Now, it's important to note that I've selected the common tab here. So all I'm seeing are things that I added to that customer2 class. If I click all, I see not only the things I put in there, but also a bunch of other stuff like get hash code, get type, reference equals, to string. Where did those come from? Well, remember, every class in the .NET framework, even ones that you create, inherit from the base object class. And the object class provides equals, get hash code, get type, reference equals, and to string methods. So even though I didn't write them, my class has a to string method. Doesn't do anything interesting, but it's in there. Okay, let's go back and finish this up. And I'll choose customer name equals, what should I choose? Maria Anders. And cust a 
to update location. Now, why choose update location? Because it means I can set three properties with one method call. I don't have to set three individually. So I can pass in the new city, which will be New York, the new region, NY, and the new postal code, 10012. There we go. Let's display information about the customer. Console.writeLine ocustA.getLocation. That seems that's the one that's going to display the city, state, and zip all glued together. And we can even try retrieving a single property. Console.writeLine custA.country. And there we go. Let's work on the second customer. Cust B dot customer name equals Patricio Simpson and the update location. Spell it right, of course. And we'll pass in Toronto, Ontario. The postal code is M9W1JI. And the country is Canada. Notice that I called a different version of update location this time. Now here, when I call custA.country and retrieve that property, what's it going to be? Remember that we set a default value for the country for the customer. So that'll be clearly USA. Come along here, let me copy these to the clipboard and paste them down here and try it instead for cust B. The same information. Oh, you know what? I'm going to do it the other way around. Let's retrieve the location property this time, just to prove that I can. All right, so I think we're done. Let's save it and run it. Now if I try customer2 class, letter C, it works fine. You see, here is the location for the first customer and the country for the first customer. Here's the location for the second customer and the country for the second customer, which we set different ways. Okay, before we leave this, let me try it once again, but I want to set a breakpoint back in our code. Let's go back over here, right there. Let's run the procedure again. C. Here's our breakpoint, and let's look and see what happens if we expand cust B. Let me select cust B and expand it. Here are all of the properties for cust B. You can see everything stored in here, and what's more, you can even come in and change things. If you want to change the country, no problem. Let's move that person to France. Okay, so you can not only investigate the properties, you can modify them while you're debugging. Press F5 to continue, and you see now that customer lives in France.